It is CNB time. Once again, folks, I am Siddharth Vinayak Patankar and we are going to jump straight into a massive, massive contest. Now, of course, last week we already showed you a massive one. The Kia Seltos took on its rivals as the new offering in the compact SUV space. So this week we've got for you the new offering in the hatchback segment. I am talking, of course, of the Hyundai Grand i10 Neos and it takes on two major rivals. So Hyundai has launched the third generation of the i10 in India, of course called the Grand i10 and this time with Neos added to it because the second generation, the previous car, the Grand i10 will continue to sell in the market alongside this one. Right, so compelling prices, great features and we've already reviewed the car and shared all its details with you. So what's left? Well, of course, it was time to see if it has the goods to take on its rivals. And so bringing in the key rivals, well, that's the important thing left to do. And so let's do that. Yep. We've got the Maruti Suzuki Swift and we've got the Ford Figo. Now, quick disclaimer here, Maruti says that its Swift is a segment higher than the Grand i10. We don't quite agree. And so, which is why, of course, it's here as a part of the shootout. The new Hyundai Grand i10 drives into a segment that was once the most hard fought in the market. The development of the premium hatches over the past few years has seen all the attention go to the i20, Jazz, Baleno segment. But the volumes still come from here. Incidentally, when the previous generation drove in six years ago, it was crowned the NDTV car of the year 2014. So, the new car has a lot to live up to. The new Grand i10 Neos is a formidable product in that it takes the already high benchmark set by its predecessor to a new level. But since that car came, many others have followed too. Now you could argue that the Maruti Suzuki Wagon R, Tata Tiago and even the aging Nissan Micra could have also been in this contest, but the most relevant rivals are here. The fourth generation Maruti Suzuki Swift, third for India, arrived at the 2018 Auto Expo. The car has impressed with its build quality, sporty dynamic and overall appeal. Plus the higher variants offer a lot of equipment. Just like on the Grand i10 Neos, dual airbags and ABS are standard too. But strangely, the Swift still doesn't have a contrast roof option, while some variants of the Grand i10 Neos do. The Ford Figo has been around since 2015, but it got its significant facelift only this year. It gets a decent equipment list and has very comfortable seating. The sense of space on this car is ample and it has a high riding, comfortable stance for passengers. In terms of styling, the three cars are distinct enough and yet there's some sort of a similarity about them. In terms of size, for sure, they look really evenly matched. Interesting enough, the Grand i10 Neos and the Swift have the identical same wheelbase, 2450mm, but we're not talking about just the dimensions. In terms of looks, the Figo certainly looks sort of chunky and a little bit more ready for action, a little bit more rugged too, and tends to look a little larger than the other two. The Grand i10 Neos is certainly the most modern and the most contemporary looking car, and that's because it is, it is the newest, and so it has that little advantage. Right now, the DRLs are turned off, but uh, the DRL itself, interestingly, comes on three of the four variants. So it's almost standard. And that's nice because it becomes a signature of the car. On the Swift, that's something I feel like the Swift lost out on. I mean, it's just the ZXI Plus or the ZDI Plus that gets the DRL. All other variants get this really plain looking headlamp. And uh, the car lost some of its cute appeal from the previous generations, though people still like the way it looks. And it still looks recognizably like a Swift. The Figo does not have DRLs but does get automatic headlamps, which the other two do not. It also has rain sensing wipers and an electric boot release that the others don't. All three cars get 14 inch wheels at the lower end and 15 inches at the high end. All three cars also currently offer petrol and diesel engine options. The Figo has an automatic on the petrol 
while the other two cars offer AMTs on both fuel types. I say currently by the way because that will change on the Swift. Now it was Maruti who first brought AMTs to this segment and that was a great business decision because of course in terms of volume it has done pretty well. In terms of performance though of course the AMT takes away from some of the nice sporty character that the Swift is known for. So uh, well not, not much you can do about that. Now the petrol BS6 model is already on sale and so the car is BS6 compliant because remember that the diesel but it won't be making that journey across 1st of April. And in these three cars that we have today, I have to say, this has the weakest ride quality and handling. Again, surprising given the sporty nature of the Swift. The Swift is not the only BS6 petrol here. The Grand i10 Neos has also already made that transition, while the diesel will do so by early 2020. The same is true for both fuel types on the Figo, since Ford has said it will stick with diesels even in the BS6 regime. The current diesels on all these cars are ample enough. The Figo though does have the most powerful motor. It's got the grunt but isn't as punchy as you'd expect. Its gear ratios and overall transmission feel, on that diesel especially, are very very nice though. You definitely get a good sense of space in this cabin that's always been a good USP of the Figo but I have to say the chief USP remains its ride quality. It is absolutely great especially for Indian road conditions and uh, really holds itself against its rivals in that department. Steering and handling also really good and in fact these are some of the qualities of the Figo that I remember appreciating when the car first arrived. It's too bad that it has kind of, kind of gotten long in the tooth now and uh, you know doesn't quite hold out on the competition when it comes to other departments. Yes, the Figo is now appearing a bit dated and that's too bad because it does have a great chassis and has a good looking car overall too. More so post that facelift that happened earlier this year. So on to the newbie next. Now for years this has been typical of Hyundai, right? Throw in lots of equipment, lots of features and really impress the buyer. Performance, well, wasn't always the hottest, but that's starting to change. We've seen that with some of the recent launches and I've been saying that regularly, but it really comes down to this kind of a segment, right? Where the constraint and the challenge is the greatest. And oh boy, oh boy, have things turned around. I mean, in terms of ride quality, it's excellent. You've got a really precise steering wheel compared to the previous car. Handling is pretty decent too and uh, just the overall performance feel on this car is actually fun. I've uh, had quite a blast driving it around today and uh, of course I have to say I do have the manual with me right now. But we also had an exclusive bit of information coming up on Car and Bike just this week about how the Grand i10 Neos will also have a 1 litre turbocharged, the GDI variant, coming in uh, at the start of 2020. So if this is so much fun, I can't wait to drive that one. Yep, that motor should be a hoot, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. I think Hyundai missed a beat here by not offering better automatics instead of going the AMT route. Sure, it's more economical, but a sophisticated gearbox could have really showed up the Swift and Figo by stamping the Neos as the most modern and technologically advanced one. Another miss on the Grand i10 is the lack of a top spec option with six airbags. The Figo has that in the titanium blue variant that's with me today. But all cars do at least get the dual airbags and ABS as standard, so that's something. And all now meet the required crash legislation too. The three cars tick a number of boxes for interior equipment. The Figo has a nice touch screen with navigation and Bluetooth connectivity. but misses out on SYNC and Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, that its sedan alter ego, the Aspire and crossover avatar, the Freestyle, do have. Yet that screen is offered on two of three variants. 
Maruti Suzuki has new Smart Play Studio infotainment now in the Swift 2, but it's only on the ZXi or ZDI Plus variants like those DRLs. The car with me today is the ZXi AMT and so no touch screen at all. I think the ZXi and ZDI at the very least should get all this. The Grand i10 has the most appealing cabin. Light greys, patterned plastics on the dash and door trim and a really smart and upmarket upholstery on the seats. It also has AC vents at the rear on three of the four variants and a digital instrument cluster on the top two. The top spec also offers wireless phone charging. All three cars have a start-stop button and remote key hobs, but only the Grand i10 Neos has keyless entry. The top spec on all cars do have a reverse camera, while rear parking sensors are standard across all variants. Now a look at the prices and things remain reasonably evenly matched. The expectation was that the Grand i10 Neos would be a bit pricey since the company has decided to keep the older Grand i10 in the market. But prices on the car have surprised positively to some extent. The Figo remains good value for money and given its space, drivability and attributes, it comes in as our firm number two in this contest. So which car wins then? I mean, let's face it, over the last few years, the Swift has lost some of its cult status, even some volume, to its own sister, the Baleno. So, it's no longer Maruti's premium hatchback, despite what Maruti might want to call it. So, yes, the new generation, when it came in, of course, it's been around a while now, there was a lot of expectation riding on it. And the car falls short just a little bit. It could have just been a little more. And so maybe, with uh, a facelift, we might get that extra punch from the Swift. Right now, there's no doubt about it in terms of equipment levels, in terms of value, that includes, of course, pricing and also cost of maintenance. And also the fact that you'll also continue to have a diesel into the BS6 era with automatic being offered on both. The Grand i10 Neos is without a doubt the absolute winner here by a long, long mile. I know it seems like a cliche for the latest car to win, but in this case, the Grand i10 Neos really does deliver. We'll take a short break here on CNB. We come back with an electric bike. Keep watching. Welcome back. It's sporty, it's edgy, it's stylish, it's very modern, it's electric. It's silent and yet can make a lot of noise. Of course, that's the RV400 from Revolt. Now, there's a lot of excitement around this bike being electric and all, but is that its only cool factor or does it actually ride well? Pritam Bora spent time with it to get you this. It's sleek, sporty, and definitely looks different. Designed like a conventional street bike, with a sharp looking LED headlight, upside down front forks, with bodywork resembling a street bike. But with one crucial difference without an internal combustion engine. It's India's first artificial intelligence enabled electric motorcycle, and that's the Revolt RV400. The first electric motorcycle from Revolt Motors, a startup. And that's the one we're riding today. What's so special about it? Well, it's targeted at the commuter segment. So this one will compete with the conventional 125cc motorcycles. And it's got an electric motor, which puts out about three kilowatts. That's about eight and a half bhp of power. And 200 newton meters of torque on the rear wheel at zero RPM. So that's the Revolt RV400. That's the one we're riding to see what exactly does it offer and what kind of features it comes equipped with. The RV400 runs on 17-inch wheels and gets disc brakes on both wheels with combined braking system. The design overall isn't exactly breathtaking, but it's definitely likeable with its muscular front end, LED lighting all around and sporty stance. 
the RV400 does resemble the Chinese Super Soko electric motorcycle and could be based on a familiar platform. But Revolt Intellicop says almost the entire bodywork is made in India and only the battery and motor are imported. The RV400 is powered by a 3 kW electric motor and where there's a fuel tank on a conventional motorcycle, the RV400 houses its 72 volt lithium ion battery which can be fully charged in around four and a half hours. So the first thing that comes to mind is how do you charge the RV400? Well, there's several ways to charge it. Of course, uh, you can plug it in with a conventional 5 mp 10 mp socket and you plug in the portable charger here and then goes to the conventional socket if you have access to a conventional charger. The other thing is what you can do of course is take out the battery from here, you know, take off the terminal and carry the battery to your workplace or to your home and charge it overnight. Now it's got uh, several uh, features that's the instrument panel, diesel instrument panel. It shows you range, of course it shows you the kilometers, that's the speed and it's got several modes. That's eco mode, one, two is normal mode and three is sport mode. In eco mode you can do about 156 kilometers of range on a single charge. That's the claimed range on eco mode if you're riding at about 65 kilometers per hour. And in normal mode it will do about 80-90 kilometers per hour and of course claimed in sport mode, it will go down to about 70-80 kilometers in a full charge. So that's the RV400. It's got several more features we'll talk about a little later. But now, let's go and ride and tell you how it feels around this small go-kart track here. How does it handle, how does it accelerate and more. The RV400 will go up against conventional 125cc commuter motorcycles and has comparable performance. On the move, the RV400 is silent. But what is immediately likeable is that it's easy to handle. And even if it's not breathtakingly fast, it can certainly reach decent speeds in no time. Around the corners, it takes a little while getting used to. But after a few laps, it gives you the confidence to push it. Although the front end does feel like it could do with some more feedback. Designed for intra-city commutes, the RV400 will be easy to handle in traffic and the combined braking system works well. Although the ride quality felt a little stiff, we'll reserve our judgement on ride and handling till we get to ride it on actual roads. Revolt RV400 is a commuter motorcycle, so it's green and clean. On the back straight here, it's about 400 meters long. We saw a speedo indicated speed of about 69 kilometers per hour. So we don't really get to know exactly what the exact top speed is about. But it's light, it's about 108 kilos approximately, and it's nimble, so it handles quite well around the top corners here at the go-kart track. And for somebody who's starting out riding, I think this one, especially for college going guys, this one makes a really good case, provided the price is right. And uh, of course, it's got some nifty features, some nice gadgets. And overall, I think it's quite a likeable motorcycle and a uh, big thumbs up to the Revolt RV400 being the first artificial intelligence enabled electric motorcycle from Revolt Intel Pop. The RV400's claim to be enabled by artificial intelligence is mainly due to a few unique features. The dedicated Revolt app lets the owner access the battery swapping infrastructure and also set a security perimeter within a demarcated radius beyond which the RV400 will not start. Then there are the unique synthesized sounds. Not entirely realistic, but definitely a gimmick worth talking about. So that's the very interesting Revolt app. You can change the sound of the bike. There are several different sounds on the bike. 
and of course you can do a geo fencing that's a security feature you can put a geo fence around the bike say a certain kilometer radius and the bike won't go beyond it it's a security feature in case of it's an anti theft measure really and of course you can swap batteries where you can look for locations to swap batteries and you can also order a battery online all from this revolt app very interesting indeed The Revolt RV400 is a commendable product in the electric motorcycle space more so because it's primarily targeted at the lower end commuter segment for use as an urban round around the RV400 is quite a likable motorcycle light nimble and will be definitely easy to use once the battery swapping infrastructure is in place the build quality could have been better and the synthesized sound it offers are more of a gimmick than to be of any practical use but as one of the first electric commuter motorcycles on offer it certainly makes a strong statement well that's a wrap here on cnb i hope you enjoyed today's program the big shootout with the hatchbacks and of course that revolt which so many of you have been very curious about please react to what you've seen please wear your helmets on an electric or internal combustion engine bike and of course wear your seat belts bye bye